Okay, so hello and welcome to the class. Uh, my name is Shara Starr and I'll be your instructor for this week. Um, and I'm going to be going over a program that teaches coding and it's called Scratch and we're going to learn how to make a game in it. So we're going to learn how to go over how to make the game itself and we're also going to learn how to customize it by making our own art and sound. And we're going to learn a little bit about game making as well. So if you have any questions during this lecture, please write them down and ask them to me on Discord after the lecture so I'll have time to answer them. This video will be available to watch afterwards, so if you miss any parts, you can go back to the video. If you have any trouble getting started after the lectures, I'll also be available during certain hours for the rest of the week to help explain things to you. Or if you get stuck and you need any help, I'll be there too. But please hold your questions and write them down until the lecture is done. So I'm going to walk you through every step, and I'm going to try and explain a bit as much as I can while I go, so that you have a better understanding of what I'm doing, and why I'm doing it that way. And hopefully at the end, you'll have been able to create your first game, and in the future, hopefully you'll try to make your own games. So our goal is to get a completed and working game of Pong by the end of this week. And today, we're going to be learning about Scratch and its interface. So Scratch is a great start before you begin to learn to program. It's a visual program that allows you to use pre-programmed puzzle pieces containing different types of code to see how code works in real time so that you can get a better idea of how programming concepts work. You can create all kinds of 2D games in Scratch. So code can be a little intimidating to look at at first, and sometimes it can be a little difficult to understand, but seeing it visually really helps to understand how it works, and Scratch will allow us to do that. So you can use Scratch online at scratch.mit.etu. And we'll start creating a new game by clicking Create. If it doesn't work in your browser, you can also scroll down to the bottom and under support, click download. This, this will allow you to use Scratch on your computer if you don't have an internet connection. So I've used both and the downloadable Scratch is better for larger projects but you don't really need to worry about that unless your browser starts lagging. So if you go onto the Scratch website, you can see all sorts of examples of games that people have made. And the coolest thing about this website is that it shows you the code that other people have used to make their games. So you can learn just by looking through all the games that have already figured out how to do certain things. So you can create all kinds of 2D games in Scratch including things like arcade games, puzzle games, racing games, platformers, point and click games. And some ambitious people have even figured out how to create some basic three games, 3D games, which I think is pretty cool. So today we're gonna to go over the Scratch interface and we're gonna get you acclimatized to it. And tomorrow we'll begin making Pong. So I'm gonna open Scratch by clicking the create at the top of the screen. And this is the Scratch interface. So I'm going to overview what each part of the screen is used for. So at the top we have the menu, and clicking Scratch will bring you back to the main menu. The little globe will allow you to choose what language you want to learn work in. File will allow you to save your game or load a saved game from your computer. And I want you to make sure to save often, because you don't want to learn, lose any of your work if anything goes wrong. Because it's saved on your browser, if you clear your browser history, you'll lose your game. So make sure to save it in a place on your computer that you'll be able to find easily so you can load it again if you want to. The edit button also has something called turbo mode and it'll make your blocks run as fast as they can. I'm not gonna use it for this project, but it's good to know what's there just in case you want to experiment with how fast your game runs. And there's also a tutorials button in case you want to learn more. And there's lots of tutorials that you can look through. A 
Okay, so now below this, we have three tabs. There's code, there's costumes, and there's sounds. And these tabs change depending on what sprite or backdrop we have in a, uh, currently selected. So keep an eye on them because they might change depending on what we select. So we'll flip between these three tabs while we're making our game. And I'll go over coding first. So code is where we put our coding and it's where all of our scripts are going to go. So clicking this will allow you to see all of the different puzzle pieces that we can use to code with. And it'll bring up your code in the middle window. They're nicely organized so that they're easier to find. So on the left in code, you'll see a bunch of different colored circles. And these are the block categories for the type of code that we're going to use. So every time we click a category, you'll notice the puzzle pieces that you can choose from changes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about these different sections. So the motion blocks deal with the movement of your sprites and their location on the screen. So if you need something like your character to move, you'll use a motion block. Look blocks deal with the appearance of your sprites on the stage. So right now, our sprite is a cat. A look block can change the way the way the a look block can change the way that the cat looks or animates, or it can apply graphic effects like changing its size or its color. It can hide or show it, or it can even make the character talk with a speech bubble. So sound blocks, they control the playing of sounds. So whether you want a sound to start or stop playing, you want to change the pitch or the volume, this is where you control your sound. Event blocks are, various, are related to various triggers in a project. So if one part wants to signal another to start running, you would use one of these. So I generally use this when I want the game to start, when you want something to happen when something else happens first, or if you want to send out a signal to another piece of code to let it know it's time for it to start running. And we'll get into more on that in detail in the future. As for the control blocks, these control the flow of your code and in what order it's executed. So it provides functions like loops and if statements, and it can also lose pauses before it runs the next piece of code. Sensing blocks try to sense when certain conditions are met. And they can be used to sense for when sprite touches another, check for specific keys being pressed, check to see if your mouse cursor is over something, or even ask a question to receive an answer from the player, like asking their name. Operator blocks deal with the mathematical functions within a project. A good example would be if you had to minus the damage received versus your current HP, you'd need to minus your current HP with the damage received in order to get your new current HP. You can also check to see if certain conditions are met, like checking to see if you have oil and a key in order to open a door. Variable blocks can hold a changeable value in them. It's like a container that holds a number that can change or can hold things in a list. Some good examples of variables you might use would be to hold your score, your HP, or the current speed that something's currently going. And then finally, there's my blocks. And that basically allows you to hold custom procedures for selected sprite. If you find yourself repeating code a lot, it might be easier to create a block that does it for you every time. It'll keep the project smaller and it's more efficient. There's also an ability to click on the bottom and choose an extension. And there's lots of different things that you can do. We're not going to go over these, but they're good to know that they exist. So in the middle of the screen is where we're going to place our code. And right here at the top right, there's a green flag and this starts your game. And then there's a stop sign that ends it. The little window below that is your game window. And that's what your game looks like. And this is where your game will play. If you want to see your game full screen, you can click the little arrows button and then you can click again to resize it again. So whenever you're testing your game, it's really helpful to have this little window so you can test quickly.
and below your game window is where your sprites are kept. You can think of the sprite as a character, a background, or even a projectile, like if you want to throw an apple at someone. It's basically anything in the game that is interactable or movable. And each sprite holds its own code, and you can see we have one right now. It's the little orange cat in the middle of the screen. There's no code in the middle because we haven't written any code for this cat yet. So let's give our cat a name. I'm going to call him Tiger. Over here, we have its X value and its Y value. So I have a little image here to help you d imagine this better. Um, so the middle of the screen will always be X zero and Y zero. The X axis runs horizontally and it goes from positive to negative. And the Y axis runs vertically and it goes from positive to negative as well. So if I change these, if I want a positive Y of 100, he's going to move up. And if I do minus 100, he's going to move down. And in the middle of the screen is going to be zero. And same with the X, 100, and minus 100. And then in the middle of the screen, we have a zero. We can also change his size. So the default size is 100, but if he's too big or too small, you can change that. So I'm gonna change his size to 200, and that makes him really big. And then I'm going to change him to 20, and that makes him really small. But I kind of like his size, so I'm gonna keep him at 100. You can also rotate the direction. The default is 90. Just one second. Sorry, I just had to answer a question. Okay, so now I wanna demonstrate how to move our little cat. So first we're going to need to go into events of code because we need to know that the game, we need to the game to know when it starts. So we're gonna take this little puzzle piece and this basically says when we start the game, then it'll start running the code. And I want my little cat to move. So I'm going to go into motion and I'm going to play with some pieces to see what they do. So first, I'm going to give him a move 10 steps piece, and I'm going to make him move 50 steps. So now if I play the press, if I play the game, you'll see that he moves forward by 50 steps. So basically steps in Scratch is pixels. So he's moving 50 pixels forward every time I start. But you'll notice that I can just keep doing it and there's nothing to tell him to go back to where he started. So what I'm going to do to fix this is I'm going to choose go to X, put this in front. And basically what I'm doing here is I want the computer to start him in the middle of the screen every time I start this. So now he starts in the middle and then he automatically moves 50 steps. But you'll notice that the animation is instant, and I don't really want that. I want him to walk. So I'm going to take this off, and I'm going to change the Move 50 Steps button to Glide. So 
So now this will make him glide in one second to a random position. And let's see what that makes him do. So this might be good for an NPC or a non-playable character, but I want to be able to control our cat. So I'm going to drag off the glide one sex to a random position puzzle piece because we don't need it anymore. And for this, we're going to need a sensing block because we want the computer to sense if we're clicking or pressing a key. And I'm going to choose the mouse down button. So you'll notice that the blocks are a different shape and they don't actually fit. So we're not actually missing an important piece here. So if you have a round piece, you can stick them in anything that has a round shape. And for this, I'm gonna to need to find something that fits this shape. So for now, I'm going to need a control piece. And this is where we're gonna want a loop and an if statement. So the way Scratch reads code is that well, it will only read through it once, and it'll only execute it once unless told otherwise. So if we tell it to look for a mouse press when you start the game, at this point, it would check once and then never again. But we don't want that. We want it to check constantly. So we're gonna add something called the loop, and it will run whatever code is within it continually. So we're gonna choose a forever block and whatever code is in here will run for as long as the game is running. But there's still no place to put the mouse down piece and that's because we're going to need an if statement as well. An if statements check to see if something is happening before it executes the code. So I'm gonna drag in an if statement. Now the mouse down block works here, so I'm gonna put it in. So now Scratch is going to continually check to see if we've clicked our mouse button, but we still haven't told it what to do when we click. So the code that we want to operate when we click the mouse button should be located inside of the if statement. So I'm gonna drag back in the glide puzzle piece and I'm gonna change a few things. I'm going, to have the clack, I'm going to have the cat glide over one second, and then I'm going to click the drop down and choose mouse pointer. So now I'm assuming that when I click somewhere on the screen, the computer will notice that I pressed the down button and then make the cat move to where I clicked in one second. So let's test this. So now we've got him walking. I'm going to press the stop button to stop the game. I don't need the move 50 steps button anymore, so I'm going to hover over it and I'm going to press backspace to delete it. As long as it's not connected to anything or called by any event, it won't be read by the game during runtime, but it's messy and I like to tidy my space up if I don't need it. The same thing will happen when you're actually programming you will either comment out code that you don't need anymore or you'll, you'll delete it because you don't want messy code. So now that we've got our little cat walking, I want to animate him so that it looks like he's walking. So I might even want to animate his walking for other things too, like cutscenes. So I'm going to make this an event so I can call up this animation anytime I want. So to do this, I'm going to find an event called broadcast. And I'm going to create a new broadcast called walking. And then I'm going to find a new piece called when I receive walking.
and this way I can run a new snippet of code alongside his gliding. So a broadcast will call out for additional code to start running either alongside the original code or pause the original code and run anything under the broadcast. We want both snippets of code to run at the same time, which is why I didn't choose broadcast walking and wait. So I'm going to put broadcast walking on above gliding so that when before the cat moves, it tells Scratch to run everything in the broadcast when I receive walking so that it animates while moving the cat and not after. So I'm going to want to animate the cat under this new puzzle piece. So first we're going to go into the tabs and we're going to take a look at his costumes. So each sprite has different costumes that you might want to use. And if you're making your own graphics, you might want to choose how many frames of animation you have yourself. So he only has two frames, costume one and costume two. And I'm going to use these to animate him. So we want to change his graphics, so first I'm going to go back into code, and I'm going to go into looks. And he's currently using costume 1, and we want to be able to switch his costume to costume 2. So I'm going to drag this in here. And now we want to switch it back to 1, but there's a problem with that. Unless there's a wait time, the switch will be instant and it'll make it look like nothing happened at all. So we'll need to control the code and make it wait. So under control, I'm going to choose wait one seconds. One second is kind of long in between animation, so I'm going to change this to 0.2. I'm going to need this piece a couple of times, so I'm going to copy paste it using control C and control V. And I'm going to need three of these. So first I'm going to want to switch him back to costume one and then back to costume two and then back to costume one. So I'm doing this twice so that we can see him move between frames a couple of times. So now when he walks, he has a short little animation. This is repetitive code though, and there's a simpler way to do it. So I'm gonna delete the last two and drag in a repeat loop, which will repeat all the code within it twice. It essentially does the same thing as our last code, but it's simpler and it doesn't involve repeating code. It means you can easily adjust it to happen as many times as you want, so it's faster overall. So I'm gonna get a repeat. I'm gonna get rid of this repeating code. drag this in here, and I only want this to repeat two times. So this does the exact same thing, but it doesn't involve repeating code, so it's a lot cleaner. So if you want the animation to move faster or slower, you can change the wait time between the costumes, or if you want him to animate more or less than that, add or remove costume switches. It also means if you have more frames, you can add them into the code so that the animation is less choppy. You can also speed them up to get more frames per second. For example, a Disney cartoon is so fluid looking because it uses 24 frames per second. So now we have a little animated cat that walks where we want him to, and I'm going to make him a friend. So our cat is a sprite, and we're going to want to add another sprite. So down here, I'm going to click the Add Sprite button, and there's a lot of prefabs. So I'm going to scroll down, and I'm going to find a crab. 
You'll notice now that we've created a new sprite, our code has disappeared. An important thing to note about Scratch is that every single sprite holds its own code data. So if you click back and forth, here's the cat's code and the crab's code. If you look at the upper right corner of your code window, you'll see an image of what sprite you have selected. So that helps you keep in mind what code you're using. I want my cat, I want my crab to be always be on the right side of my screen. So I'm going to do the same thing I did for my cat, but I don't want him to start at the middle of the screen. So I'm going to adjust his X axis. So again, when the game starts, I'm going to go into motion and I'm going to want him to change where he starts. And I want him to start at X 150 and Y zero. So if we test this, he's always going to start right here. Now I want my crab to say, come here, if our cat isn't touching him. And I want him to say, hello, I'm a crab, if our cat isn't touching him. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a forever loop with an if statement and a sensor in it again. But this time I'm going to include an else statement. So in control, I'm going to find an if with an else statement. So basically, if you have an else statement, it will run the else code unless the if statement happens. So under sensing, I want it to notice if he is touching my cat. So if he's touching my cat, the code in here will play. Otherwise, the code in here will play. So now I'm going to go into looks and I'm going to have him say something. So if he's touching the cat, I want him to say, hello, I'm a crab. And if he's not touching our cat, I want him to say, hey, come over here. So I'm going to test this now. So now the crab is calling me. And if I walk over to him, it is not recognizing that he's touching him. And the reason for this is because I didn't put this in a forever loop. So it's a technically only checking this once at the beginning of the game. So we're going to want to put this whole thing in a forever loop. And now if I test this, it works because it's constantly checking. So I kind of want there to be a little bit of a wait time between him calling us. So I'm just going to put in a wait two seconds. And the something that I don't really like is that our cat is under our crab and I really want him to be on top of everything. So I'm going to go into looks and I'm going to choose go to front layer. And I'm going to put this at the top of our code. So now if we test again, Oops, that's the crab layer. Tiger, go to front layer. Tiger, go to front layer. There, now he's on top of our crab. So layers are helpful to keep everything organized in your project. To the right of your sprites, you'll see the stage, which is each level of your game. And it's the backdrops, which are your backgrounds. So if this is selected, you'll notice that the costumes tab has now become backdrops. So these tabs are dependent on what is selected. So we're going to choose a background for our character now. 
So down here you can choose your backdrop. And since we have a crab, I'm gonna click this and I'm gonna choose Beach Malibu. Now our players have a background. And finally, we're going to add a menu screen. And to do this, we're gonna use broadcasting again. So first we're gonna create our menu screen. I'm going to add a new backdrop. This time I'm just gonna choose something like hearts. And then in your backdrops, you can actually edit it. So I'm going to use the text tool and you can change the font if you want and then click and drag to resize and now I want a button to click in order to start the game so I am going to create a new sprite and I'm going to choose button 3 So first I'm going to open up its costume and I'm going to write some text on it, again with the text button. And this time I'm going to write, click to start. Now I'm going to rearrange it on my game screen. So just grab and click, and then I'm gonna want it to be generally around here. And then once it's in a place I like, I'm going to note the X and Y position because I'm gonna need it to stay there. So I'm writing down it's at X zero and Y minus 44. And I'm going to rename this to my start button. So now we're going to go into the buttons code. So under events, when our green flag is clicked, again, we're going to add an event when the green flag is clicked. And this time we're going to create a new broadcast and this one's going to be called start game. And this is because we only want the game to start when we click the start game button. So under control, I'm going to choose a forever loop and an if then loop. And we want to check for if the mouse clicks on it. So under sensing, I'm going to go to mouse down, which basically just means if our mouse clicks on it. And now we're going to use a broadcast to do the start game state. So we're going to use a new broadcasting state under events, find broadcast, and we're going to name this one start game. And the sounds is where we'll manage the sound and music for our game. So if mouse down, broadcast start game. So now instead of when green flag clicked, we're going to want the rest of the game's code to start when start game is broadcasted. So we're going to replace those blocks. So under events, we're going to find the broadcast receiver, which is when I receive and we're going to replace the green flags on the other sprites. So I'm going to replace the green flag with this block on both the tiger and the crab when I receive start game. When I receive start game. So now we're going to test our game and you'll notice the game doesn't start until we click the button, but the sprites should be hidden when we start. So to do this, we're going to need more of these flags. So under events, find the green flag and make sure both the cat and the crab have it. 
And in order to hide the sprites, we're going to need to change it in looks. So now we're going to go to hide. And this should hide the sprites when the game starts. Now if we test the game and you click to start, you can't see the sprites, but we still need to tell Scratch to show them once the game starts. So under when I receive game, I'm going to place show. And I'm going to make sure the show is under go to X. Otherwise, we might see the character move since that would go first. So now if we test it, we still have a problem. And that's that we didn't hide the button and we didn't switch the background. So we're going to click the button sprite. And we're going to make it so that when the game shows, starts it, that it shows the button. So under broadcast start game, we're going to want to make a hide piece. And then we're going to tell it to switch the backdrop to the background that I want. So switch backdrop to Beach Malibu. So now you'll notice that we have an interesting little bug, and that's that the cat keeps moving to the center. And the reason for this is because we originally wanted it to center itself using x0, y0 when the game starts. And so all we need to do to move that is to move that to when green flag clicked. And now we have one more thing to fix, and that's that we never told Scratch what backdrop we want to start with. So we go to the start button sprite code. And we're going to choose switch backdrop to hearts and show. And this makes sure that when the game starts, the backdrop is the menu screen that we want. And now if we test again, everything runs as intended and we have a menu screen. So this concludes our first lecture. Tomorrow we're going to start how to make tomorrow we'll start learning how to make Pong in Scratch. So for now, I want you to experiment in Scratch and see what you can get working. See if you can make the characters talk to each other. Um, you can use broadcasts to do that. I want you to experiment and see what little things you can do and what you can get working. So have fun learning the interface of Scratch and I'll see you tomorrow.